So if I were to just gauge or just ask everybody here, you know, maybe one-on-one, -on -one, pull you aside and say, hey, where's God leading you? Where's God taking you? What would that answer look like? And I want you to think about it for a moment because it's something that we, we, we talk a lot about, right? I mean, the church is, is very famous for talking about the leading of the Lord and the guiding of the Lord. And, and we talk a lot about how God guides us and he leads us and he directs us. But, but the question I really want us to ponder here this morning is what does that look like? Does the Bible give us some clear indication on the, the places and the situations that God's leading us to? Right? And, and if it does, is that where our lives are? Are we looking like we're in those places? Right? Because if God does give some specific guidelines for, here's the places that I'm leading you, here are the things that I want you to be about, and then we, we analyze our lives and we go, well, I'm not in those places, then what would that lead us to conclude? That we're not being led by the Lord, perhaps. And, and maybe it's just a part of the vocabulary or the verbiage, or, hey, we're at church, so this is what we talk about while we're here, but the rest of the week I go where I want, I do what I want. If God were to reveal to us exactly where he's taking us, I think for a lot of us, we may feel either relieved, scared. Some of us may even possibly quit, right? Think about it for a moment. If the Lord were to reveal to you all the things that he was going to do in your life prior to you becoming a Christian, how many of you guys would be like, sign me up? <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Can't wait to go down that road, right? Now, ultimately, we believe, hey, the, where the Lord is leading us and taking us, that, that far outweighs any momentary light afflictions we might face in this world. But, but one of the things I want us to understand is that here this morning, that where God is leading us is not only to, to strengthen us, but it's also to strengthen others, to prepare us and to prepare others. You see, what God is looking to do in us is a work unlike any other work that this world could put together. All right, where the world is leading us is towards death and destruction. You know, and, and yes, we talk about it quite a bit, don't we? We talk about it even this morning in worship and prayer. It's just like, you know, we talk about the great darkness that has befallen this world, right? We, I mean, we know it, and we share it. Some of us like to talk about it a lot. We share news articles online, and I always get a kick out of it. It's like, can you believe, Pastor Ryan, what this person is saying? Can you believe what this world is doing? Can you believe what the government's doing here? Can you believe it? It's like, yes, yes, I can, because I've read the story, and I know exactly where this is going, and, and I'm not caught up. I, I, I don't participate in such things anymore because I don't find it to even be fruitful. What I want to know isn't where the world is going, but where is God going in the midst of this world? That's what I want to tune into. That's what I want to focus in on. We went Christmas shopping this weekend. We got a little bit more to do, actually, Potentially today, I don't know how I'm feeling about it yet, but uh, I'll let you know. But we went Christmas shopping yesterday. I took the kids out, and um, it was interesting because you give the kids a budget. You go, okay, here's the people that you have to buy presents for, okay? And when I mean you buy presents for it, it's me buying presents for it, but you get your budget, okay? So here's your budget. Here's the people you got to buy for, and I want you to think about, and this is the key, think about what they would like and then buy that for them. Because you know what the tendency of children is? Buy what they want. You know, I think Grandpa would love this little Baby Yoda action figure. I think it would be so cool. He would absolutely love it. You know what Mom would love? Mom would love this, this really neat uh, Christmas. Well, is that what Mom would like, or is that what you would like, right? And it was a conversation I had to repeatedly have with my children. And so, so too, when it comes to the leading of the Lord, right? This is where the Lord is leading me. Isn't that convenient? Because that looks a lot where, like, you wanted to be led, right? How often does that actually inform where God is leading us? Well, it's like, I feel the Lord gave me a great peace. I even got some goosebumps, right? But is that where the Lord is leading us? Psalm 32, verse 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. The promise from the Lord. I'll instruct you. I'll teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. And so starting off in verse 1 of chapter 4, we will see exactly some of the places where the Lord leads, right? Because that's what we want to find out today. Lord, where are you leading us? So starting off in verse 1, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit. Is there any question who's leading Jesus at this point? Nope. It's the Holy Spirit. It's God. 
Jesus was led up by the Spirit, by and Jew, the same Spirit which came upon Jesus as he was in the wilderness of Judea. He was baptized by John the Baptist, and the, or Baptist, I'm sorry, and, and, and the Holy Spirit came upon him, and, and, it, and it said it manifested itself in a very peculiar and interesting way out in the wilderness. That same Spirit now leads Jesus, notice with me, into the wilderness, watch this, to be tempted by the devil. You go, Pastor Ryan, I've got, this is messing up my theology right now, all right? I had this idea about God and what he leads us to do and where he's leading us, and you're saying out the gate that God himself was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted. I don't like that. I was thinking that when I came to know Jesus, right, that God would lead me into, into, into a, a lush field of, of, of fruitfulness and encouraging words and a full bank account and the right spouse and the, be, the, the children that are always behaved, that I always wanted, you know. That that's what God was going to do. He was going to make all my problems and all my hardship and all my difficulty just vanish away. At least that's what the guy on TV told me he would do. And then we read an area of Scripture like this, and we go, wait a second. God's doing what? He led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? That doesn't sound like a plan that I would have signed up for. Well, if you gave your life to Jesus, and you cry out to the Lord to be led by his Holy Spirit, you better believe he'll lead you there too. If it was good enough for his son, it's good enough for me. It goes on. Verse 2, it says, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. That makes sense. Wait, wait, wait. So the Lord's leading me, I just want to get this straight, to a place of temptation and of trial. Then he's also leading me to a place of, of, of denying the flesh, right, and finding myself hungry. Now, let me explain something to you about fasting for 40 days. Typically, when it comes to fasting, you usually, the hardest, the hardest hump they say to get over is the first few days, right? That's when your body is, is craving food the most, right? And they usually say that after about three or four days of not eating, then your body adjusts, okay? Now, you're still taking in water, okay? Jesus was still probably taking in water. He's taking these things in, right? All right? But your body is not consuming any food. It gets used to it. But then something happens at around 40 days, your body then starts to consume its own vital organs at about 40 days. And they say that the hunger, the intensity of the hunger, is more severe than at the beginning. It's harder, it's worse. Because what your body is now doing is telling you, you're dying, you better eat some food right now. That's interesting, because that's exactly where Jesus found him, at the 40-day mark, okay? And, and notice with me, Satan didn't come along to tempt him, tempt him at day one. He didn't come along at day two or day three or day four. He didn't come along two weeks in. He didn't come along three weeks in. He waited, and we note this, he waited to the most opportune time to come along and say, now let's tempt that flesh. Now let's come against you. Isn't it interesting? You ever have a bad day? It just rough. starts off rough in the morning. Maybe you got in an argument with the spouse or kids, or maybe the boss was a little rough, or whatever it is. Things just didn't go your way, right? And you're like, how much worse can the day get? Don't utter those words out loud, okay? <laughs> how much worse can the day get? It can get worse. It could potentially get worse. And in those moments, that's exactly when the enemy knows to attack. You see, the enemy is strategic. But I want you to understand this as well, if you're taking note, that the Lord, too, is also strategic. The Lord knew when the enemy was going to attack. The Lord knew when the temptation was going to come. And what God wanted them to do, or what God wants us to do, as he pictures for us in the person of Jesus Christ, is not to just lean on our own understanding, but to trust in what God is doing, that it's there for a purpose. So, so we continue on. It says, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, that's Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. 
Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, All these things I'll give you if you'll fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. And as I said before, in another translation, it says the devil left and waited for a more opportune time. Right? The devil wasn't done. That was just temptation number one that we get to read about. Right? But here's what I want us to do this morning. If you're taking note, it's important that we understand that the Lord is leading us into trial for the purpose of training for the purpose of learning, for the purpose of doing something. And whining about it, and crying about it, and fussing about it, and worrying about it, doesn't do a single thing. It was the the other day. My children know, they they watch TV in our living room, and there's one Alexa remote for for my Fire TV, right? Just one. And there's nothing that, that bugs me more, maybe I'm just easily bugged by this, is that, when the kids are in there, they're using the remote, they're playing, they're, they're watching TV, and then the remote goes missing, right? They just, guys, there's one remote, and Alexa can't be controlled by anything but that remote. You've rendered my TV. It's not like the old days where you can go up to the TV and change the channel. That used to, you realize we've made things way more complicated for ourselves now. Now you need this stinking remote, otherwise TV's done. So we're looking for... so. I usually am the one that looks for the remote, or my wife looks for the remote, and this time I was like, you know what? You guys lose this remote all the time. You guys find it, right? So now I leave the room, and I go read, and I'm going, I go do some studying and stuff like that, and now what I begin to hear is my children arguing with each other, right? And they're arguing with each other on whose fault it is that the remote is lost. And I'm listening to it. I'm just, it's your fault. Eden, you always take the remote into the other rooms, and Mom's telling you not to. It wasn't me. It was Judah. It's Judah's fault. Isn't it? And then you hear Zion, and he's like, it's all your fault. And I finally, after about 10 minutes of listening to this argument, I had enough. I go into the room, and here's the worst part about it. I told them what to do. I said, find the remote. And do you know what they were doing? They were all sitting down. Argue. It wasn't even like they were being productive in arguing with each other. They were sitting down and arguing. I said, listen, you guys better find this remote next to you. And wouldn't you know, one of the kids, I think it was Zion, kind of moves one of the ottomans. I mean, it's ever so slightly under the couch. It's like an inch under the couch. All it took was somebody just bending down and looking, oh, there it is, and took the remote. Oh, I found it. Isn't that great? But what did all the whining, what did all the arguing, what did that, satis- or what did that solve or satisfy? The Holy Spirit leads us to temptation for the purpose of training, not for complaining. And in case, again, you have a problem with this theology, I would encourage you, John, or not John, Job, chapter 1, verses 6 or 8 says this, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, Where do you come from? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it, Then the Lord said to Satan, this part, when I read this for the first time, just blew my mind. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil? Do you know what that means? That means that the Lord took Job and put him in the enemy's crosshairs. Satan says, yeah, listen, for those of you that have this idea or this theology that that Satan's somehow all-knowing and he's everywhere and it's always, you know, whenever something's going wrong in your life, it's like, it's the enemy. Whenever there's a temptation, it's the enemy. He's like, no, he's not everywhere. He has to wander about through the whole earth. And and i got to be honest with you, I, I, I think even very little, if anything at all, of my life, the temptation that comes in or the difficulty that I suffer comes from the enemy himself. I, I think that there's bigger fish to fry out there. Usually it's an issue of my own flesh or maybe some other demonic you know, creature or being. But Satan himself? No, no, no. But Job finds himself in the crosshairs of Satan, not because Satan came up with this idea, but because who? The Lord said, have you considered Job? Well, I wasn't thinking about Job until you brought him up, but now that we're talking about Job, and they go on. 
And the situations and circumstances that Job finds himself in is a direct result of the Lord bringing Job to Satan's attention. And you go, I don't like this. Well, well, here's the thing. What God wanted to do in Job's life required, required the buffeting and the attacking and the persecution and the hardship that the enemy was going to bring. Job wouldn't be the person that we look at as a source of hope or encouragement or inspiration to continue to walk with the Lord in times of difficulty or trial. He wouldn't be somebody that we read about in the scriptures if it wasn't for that exact set of circumstances and that situation in his life. We wouldn't be reading about it. We wouldn't be talking about it. There would be no Job 1, 6 through 8 that we'd be going, oh yeah, that was the Lord. And just like in your life and just like in my life, a lot of the things that we struggle to understand, God, why are you doing that? I was just talking to uh, Pastor Leland, and we were talking about um, missionaries. We have a, a missionary that's going to be coming next week um, to speak here at the church. And, and um, not Pastor Kenny, but another pastor, another min- missionary from Kenya, from Africa. And he, he ministers in the, the slums of Nairobi, right? It's, 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 yeah, it makes our, our, our rough areas, our rough neighborhoods, look like a walk in the park, all right? And... Um, and we were talking about how he, one of his friends who was a missionary in Haiti had recently passed away, I think he was telling me. And, and as he was passing away, he, he was able to, I guess, speak to him, and he says, he says, this is good. This is good. And you're like, what? You're dying, and you're going to leave behind five children. This is good. God's, God's, still control, and st- God's still in control. God's still going to use this. And the level of spiritual discipline and the level of spiritual understanding to come to a place in your life, no matter the attack, no matter the circumstances, no matter the situation, where you can look on and go, this is good because this has been orchestrated by God. Guys, that's something that I aspire to. He even said, I don't know if I could say something like that in that moment. And maybe you're here this morning and maybe you feel like you were under the weight of the world and under the attacks of the enemy and you don't understand why the circumstances of your life have unfolded the way that they are, please know this, God is still sovereign, and it is good. All things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to His purpose. God doesn't make mistakes, and He doesn't lie about such things. Just because we can't understand it doesn't mean it's any less true. In case you're wondering, Job never gets privy or never gets the information about that conversation that God has with, with Satan. You read through the whole book of Job, God never explains himself to Job. Never tells him this is what went down. Never tells him this is why this is going down this way. And so we see even the Lord himself lays out for us that the purpose of the attacks of the enemy, the trials that we face, that they're for good. And what he wants us to know too is that the enemy is out to steal, kill, and destroy your life. That's what he was trying to do with Jesus' ministry. He wanted to subvert it before it even had an opportunity to lift up off the ground, before it had an opportunity to even go anywhere. And note with me this, that the enemy's playbook has remained the same since the very beginning of time. And we're going to cover that here at the end. But first, if you're taking note, please note this, that one of the first attacks that the enemy uses is the age-old promise, or the age-old adage, if you will, that if it feels good, do it. Jesus is 40 days into the fast. He is hungry, and he's experiencing hunger pains like most of us will never even know. And the first thing that the enemy does and says, listen, if you are the Son of God. Now, isn't it interesting? You realize Satan knows exactly who he's talking with, right? He he saw Jesus in heaven. Satan used to be a resident of heaven. Believe me when I tell you, he knows that Jesus is the Son of God. But what he's saying is, listen, listen. I'm going to both attack your hunger and your pride all at the same moment. If you're the son of God, since you're so hungry, since you find yourself in a situation where you can make things better for yourself, why not do it? If it feels good, just go with it. Just do it. It's an age-old attack. It's the lust of the flesh that he's attacking. And the enemy attacks in a strategic way. 
And one of the ways that the enemy attacks us in our lives is when we find ourselves in a situation where we're going through hardship and we're struggling and, 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 and we need, we feel like we need something. We, we need more money. We need, we, we, we need food. We need something that will make my situation better. The enemy attacks with a lie that says God doesn't understand that. God's up in heaven, Jesus. He's not experiencing hunger. You're down here on earth. You're experiencing it. You're suffering through it. God doesn't understand you. And how many times has the enemy planted that little lie into our ears, into our hearts? Listen, you're justified in sinning against the Lord. You're justified in being disobedient in this moment. And you know why? Because God doesn't understand where you're at. He doesn't understand your circumstance or your situation. But Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18 says this, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. You want to know the reason why Jesus came and suffered? And He didn't have to go through this. He had nothing to prove to anybody. I mean, think about it. What did Jesus have to prove to Satan or to any of us? Absolutely nothing. He came of his own will, of his own volition. He shows up. He's going to rescue mankind. He didn't have to suffer through this. But it says that he does so, so that he might aid us in our temptation, so that we can understand God went through it. God went through it just like we are. He understands. In fact, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. The temptation here that the enemy is trying to attack the Lord with is to break the fast. Don't obey. But Jesus says over and over again, not just here, but in many other areas of Scripture, that he always does the will of his Father. The best way to overcome this temptation is sub to submit not under the authority of our passions, but to submit under the wisdom of the Lord and His Word. I know I'm feeling this way. I, you know, I, was, I don't know if this is the proper use of the term, forgive me, because I'm not as hip and young as I used to be. But these young kids, they use this, it makes me feel some kind of way. I've heard young people say, oh man, that's got me feeling some kind of way. It's like, man, don't trust whatever you're feeling or whatever that way is. Trust the Lord. Don't submit under the dictates of your, of your passions or of the flesh, but understand that God understands it far better than even you do in the moment. Prioritize the Word of God over the worship of passion. In fact, that's exactly what Jesus says. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, whatever satisfies the flesh in the moment, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We don't live according to the dictates of the flesh. If we do, then we're going to go in the error of the enemy. But if we will submit ourselves under the dictates of the Word of God, we'll find ourselves victorious in those moments. I'm not asking you to, to, to call out Scripture by memory, but, but listen, I find myself many a times when I'm going through the hardest times of my life just opening up the Word of God, spending time in prayer, and going, all right, Lord, I can't go by how I feel in this moment. I have to go by what Your Word says. I'm trusting in You. I'm trusting in Your Word. And it's not the first time that the Lord was attacked in such a way. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 40, it says, In saying, this was what the, the Pharisees and the priests were saying to Jesus while He was on the cross, You who destroy the temple and built it in three days, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. Isn't that just like the enemy? You're going through hardship. You know how this could be all fixed, right? You know how you can make this better, right? Just give in. Just compromise. Don't you just hate arguing with your spouse about going to church? Don't go. It would be so much easier. Don't you hate arguing with your kids about going to church? Just stop. Don't go. Don't do it no more. It would be so much easier. Man, don't you, just, don't you hate when the people at your workplace put you down for believing in Jesus or talking about the gospel, just stop talking about it. It'd be so much easier. Why do it? And that's how the enemy creeps in. Fix it. You can fix it. You know, I get a kick out of, especially in the midst of, of temptation, is, is this idea that Christians don't go through it. 
I get it all, all the time at work and in, in, in settings where I'm around unbelievers, you know, especially if they drink or if they, they curse or they say something, you know, something inappropriate. They're like, oh, I forgot you don't curse. Oh, I forgot you don't drink. Oh, I forgot you don't do that. Oh, I forgot you don't do this. It's like, what do you mean I don't? Isn't that interesting? What do, you, what do you mean I don't? I can't. That's what usually I should say. I don't. I can't. I can do it better than you probably. All right? If only you knew me in my heyday. Right? It's not that I can't. It's that I choose not to. Because I don't live according to the dictates of the flesh, but according to the word of God. That's what governs my life. That's what navigates it. In Ezra, chapter 7, verse 10, it says, For Ezra had prepared his heart. This is the priest, Ezra. He had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. You know what that verse means? It didn't just flow naturally into him. I mean, sometimes we think that, that, that walking with the Lord and overcoming temptation is there something you pray for and then, then all of a sudden just this, this supernatural force just endows you with the ability to no longer be tempted. I'll never feel temptation again. I'll never lust again. I'll never be jealous again. I'll, ne- I'll, I'll walk through this situation and through this circumstance. I'll, I'll flow through it. It'll be easy from now on. Smooth sailing. That's not what it says. It said Ezra prepared his heart. You know why? Because the world around him was going cuckoo. The, the, the place and the situation that he found himself in, the people were rebellious against doing what God... But he knew that he had to prepare his heart to do what God called him to do, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the attacks in the enemy, regardless of what the other people around him were doing. He prepared his heart to do it. And that's what it takes. To prepare our hearts to, to, to study the Word of God and to do what it says... Let's move on to the second part here. It says, Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Isn't that interesting? The enemy takes at Jesus, once again knowing full well who he is, and says, If you are, if you are, here's what I want you to do. I want you to prove it to everybody around you. I want you to to prove it to yourself. I I, I want you to to wow me, to show me that that, that who you say you are is who you really are. And and it's interesting, the Lord's response, because what the Lord equates it to, it, it, it doesn't seem like this is what the enemy is trying to tempt him to do in the moment, but we see here that Jesus is wise to his plans. He says, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. In other words, what Satan is trying to tempt Jesus with here is what we call the pride of life. Elevate yourself. Exalt yourself. Show everybody. Make sure they know that you're not somebody to be trifled with. Make sure that they know who you are. Make sure you stand up for your rights. Don't you let anybody take advantage of you. Don't you let anybody do you wrong. All right? You show them. And doesn't that sound a lot like the world and the society that we live in now? Exalt yourself. Elevate yourself. It's all about having a high self-esteem, a high self-worth. Right? Do you realize that, that, that in the Lord, we have the most worth that we could possibly have, that all of our self-worth and that self-esteem comes not from our flesh, but only because of the work of our Lord. Our value in life comes from our commitment to Jesus Christ. Because apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, we're dead. We're spiritually dead. There's no hope for us. We're we're dead in our sins and we're dead in our trespasses and and, and we're slaves of sin. And and there's no hope. There's no light there. But when the Lord Jesus enters in, that's what gives our life the purpose, the meaning, the value that we so hope for and we so long for. And Jesus' response to Satan to, to, to give oneself over to pride is very simple. No, we don't tempt the Lord in such a way. I want to point out a story. It's in Acts chapter 13, verse 4 through 12. Allow me to read it to you here. It says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. This is talking about some of the disciples. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. 
And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Underline that part if you're taking note or just write it down. John is their assistant. We'll get back to that in a moment. Now, when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. That translates to son of Jesus, all right, who was with the proconsul, Sergius, Paulus, an intelligent man, this man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Eliamus, the sorcerer, that's Bar-Jesus, for his name is translated, withstood them seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O full of, o full of all deceit and all fraud, this, you, I'm sorry, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what he had done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now, there's so many rich nuggets in this area of Scripture, but there's a couple that I want to point our, our eyes to. Interestingly enough, here this person who has named himself a son of Jesus Christ directly, Paul reveals to everybody, including himself, who he really is a son of, right? He says, you're a son of a devil, if you're operating in pride, please understand this, that you are doing the work of the enemy. It was, the, it was pride that caused Satan to fall from heaven. It was him exalting himself above God, above God's plans, above God's wisdom, and says, I know what's best. I'm going to lead myself. I'm going to do what I want to do with my life. And it's that very thing that caused him to fall. You can't be a son of the, of the Most High God, a daughter of the Most High God, and exalt yourself and elevate yourself above His wisdom. We got it so mixed up in this world. We, we think it's about exalting ourselves and, and showing God He made the right choice when He picked me, that I know how to lead my own life, that I know how to go where I want to go. And, and all that leads us to is not a place of real exaltation, but a place of destruction. All it reveals is not that you're a son or daughter of God, but that you're a son or daughter of the enemy. You're doing his work. You're acting and behaving just like he did. And interestingly enough, I said we get back to it. Here you have John. John was an apostle, okay? One of the twelve. Probably one of the most prominent of the twelve, right? Because it said that, that, that he, was, he, he was beloved by the Lord, right? And that he, he rested his head on the Lord's bosom. He lived longer than all the other apostles. He lived to a full, ripe old age. He was one of the few apostles that it's believed wasn't martyred for his faith. Right? And, and so here you have John taking on the position of a what? Of an assistant. You have Paul, okay, who was a persecutor of the church, who it's writing about here, going into this region, and he brings along John as the, the humble assistant and servant. Imagine you're John. You'd be like, really, dude? You're picking me to be the assistant here? You know who I am? You know how long I spent? How much time did you spend with Jesus? How, uh, how many people did you kill that followed Jesus? And now I get to be the assistant? But here's the beautiful thing, that while Bar Jesus claimed to be a son of God, claimed to be enlightened by God, claimed to be somebody of spiritual knowledge and understanding. He goes blind, but yet what John gets to see because of his humility and willingness to follow Jesus wherever he led, he gets to see things that most people could only dream of. But he gets to see the Lord do and show up in his life because of his humility. You want me to be an assistant? I'll be an assistant. Better to be what? A gatekeeper, right? In the house of the Lord. Proverbs 29, verse 23 says this, A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. You know, a lot of times I think one of the reasons why God wants to keep us from pride is to to so that we can avoid the embarrassment of that pride being revealed. My wife reminded me this week, I, uh, 
for a very short period of time, I have to preface this correctly, for a very short period of time, only a couple days, all right, I was a part of a, a boy band, okay? You know, you guys are going to laugh. I know. I see it already. It's like, Pastor Ryan, did you actually? Th- you should have kept that one quiet. You never said anything. It was in the 90s, man. Everybody was like, you know, boy bands are cool. And listen, even if you didn't li- like or listen to them, you still knew that they were, you know, they had it going on. All the girls liked them and stuff like that. So I thought, you know what? I think I can sing, okay? If you all sit next to me, you know I think I can sing. It doesn't mean that I actually can, but I sing loudly, all right? And, and, and I thought, you know what? I can dance. I think I can dance, you know? And that, that I can't do either. You know, I've got a couple moves in my repertoire, but it ain't much. And so I was like, you know what, I'm going to join this boy band. It was a group of friends of mine, and I'm going to join it. And, and I was a part of it for like two days before they kicked me out, all right? And I was so, I was so, I was so angry about it because I thought to myself, I'm better than most of those guys in there. And the only reason why they got in was because their parents were the managers, and they got no talent, and, they got, and, and now they get to go around, and they were, do, they were actually doing some shows for a little while, and one of them actually moved on to be like a, a somewhat of a famous producer now in the music industry and music business. And I was just like, man, you know, I could have done that. I, could, I was better than them. My wife tells me a story that I had forgotten about the other day. She goes, yeah, it was, it was a couple of weeks after the band got formed and you got kicked out that they went to my father at our church and they said, hey, listen, we've got this band and we'd love to perform for the church and maybe you can have us come in and do it. And so Pastor Jim, you know, he says, well, is it like a Christian band? And, and the leader of it goes like, yeah, yeah, it's a Christian band. Uh, yeah, we're, we're all Christians and it's a band, you know. And so he's like, okay, well, maybe you show me what it is that, that you're doing. And he goes, okay. And so they get the group together and they get up on the stage and they cue the music and and Pastor Jim tells the story. He's like, it was one of the most cringy things he had ever seen. He says, here they are in front of their pastor doing these weird moves, you know, that's, I can't, I'm not going to you know, try them. I'm too old for that. But anyways, they're doing these weird moves and gyrations. And then they're singing about girls. And, they, and you're just like, what part? There's like zero discernment here. This is your, this is your pastor you're doing this for. You don't feel the least bit awkward about this, you know? He's like, I don't usually like when people feel awkward around me because I'm a pastor. He goes, but in that moment, I wanted them to feel that awkwardness, right? And it's like, and I hear that story, and I'm like, thank you, Jesus. (laughs) He would have never let me marry his daughter. It would have been over. He would have looked on and goes, no, honey, not him. For sure not him. The Lord was sparing me. But me and my pride and my arrogance, you know, in the moment, I'm like, well, why not? I'm just as good. I deserve it more. And we could even do that in the body of Christ. You see somebody that you know, it's like they barely show up for church and they don't walk with the Lord hardly and they don't give. I give. They don't give. I know that they don't give. And, and, and we make all the justifications. We make all the justifications. Why God's wrong for allowing them to be blessed or prosper in certain areas. You know, one, the psalmist, he lamented over the exact same thing. He said, my foot almost stumbled when I saw the ungodly prosper. You, you know what got his attention? You know what caused him to not be jealous or envious of the ungodly? He says, and when I saw their end. When I saw their end. I went into the household of God, and I remembered what the end looks like. I remembered what it means to not know God in that moment. So how do we overcome the temptation to fall into pride? It's to recognize, as Jesus points out, that God doesn't need to prove anything to us. He says, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And that word for tempt in the Greek is the word ekparizo. It means to prove. To prove. That's what Satan's telling Jesus to do. Prove it. Show me. Right? Right? And we do the same thing God. The way that we fall into pride is by assuming that we know better than God, that God has something to prove to us, that he has to answer to us, that we've got more wisdom and understanding in the situation than God does. He says, recognize God's got nothing to prove to you. He's already proven his love, his loyalty, his dedication through the cross. 
to prove, to test, to put to proof God's character and power. He says, don't fall into that temptation. And thirdly, we see it says in verse 7, Jesus said to him, um, I'm sorry, verse 8, again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I'll give you if you will fall down and worship me. Man, I'll give it all to you. Just worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only, him only, Shall you serve? Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. The third tactic of the enemy is to provide temptation through the lust of our eyes. To serve the temporal over the eternal. It's, a very, interest, it's, it's very interesting to note here that Satan goes to Jesus and he says, Listen, I'm going to give you everything that you see. This world, a pinnacle, a very high place, right? Some believe it's like a mountain. Some believe it was, it was Mount Zion. And there's lots of theories on where it was. But he takes him to a high place and he shows him. You ever been up on a high mountain? There's um, Pikes Peak, I think it's in Colorado, right? Pikes Peak in Colorado. You could see four states, I think it is, from the top. You ever been that high up where you look out and you're like, I can see a lot of stuff right now. That's what the enemy did with, Satan, or with Jesus. He says, I'm going to take you. you. This is all yours. And do you know what Jesus doesn't do? He doesn't argue with him over who it belongs to. That's a very interesting point. He doesn't say, no, you can't. That's not yours. That doesn't belong to you, in fact. Now, now there are some theories on that, right? And here's my theory. It's a moot point. Jesus had nothing to prove to Satan from the very get-go. Even if it was, and some theorize, that it was in the possession of the enemy until the redemption of mankind, when Jesus Christ died on the cross and redeemed the earth and redeemed mankind, even if that's the case, he knew who would ultimately possess it. He knew that, as Paul says, this is a momentary light affliction. I got nothing to worry about. I got nothing to freak out over. Even if this is the end, it's only the end for a short period of time, and then it's eternity afterwards. Even if the circumstance or the situation that you find yourself in, it feels like the end, and even if it is the end for here and now, it is not the end for all of eternity. And Jesus said, listen, you could promise me anything. Remember we're going through numbers, right? And Balaam, the prophet, the false prophet, right? And what does he say repeatedly? You could offer me all the, the silver and gold in your house, and it still wouldn't be worth it, but we knew he was really after that. When Jesus says it, he means it. How about you and me? When we say, Lord, all to you I surrender. Well, all to you but that part right there. <laughs> I'll never deny you unless you make a much better offer. I mean, then maybe it's worth it here. Jesus says you could promise it all, and I wasn't going to deviate from saving this people. How do you love the Lord? How much do you love the loyalty, the commitment of our God? The enemy was offering him another way. You want this all? I'll give it all to you. Just worship me. Mm -mm, not going to happen. There's this, this there's misinformation that's going around. And that is, is that, that somehow compromise won't produce some sort of benefit in your life. No, you can compromise. You can compromise on your standard of a spouse, and you'll get a spouse. You can compromise on your commitment to stewardship and financial integrity, and maybe you get more money. You can compromise on arguments and not wanting to hassle with the kids over serving the Lord or doing what's right. You, there's lots of compromise now. You can compromise at your workplace and, and, and rise up in the ranks, and you might never get found out here on earth. You might only receive the... listen. If, there, if it wasn't effective, people wouldn't do it, okay? There's a reason why there's a lot of bad businessmen and women out there that have a lot of money, and seemingly on the outside, even some happiness. But what will it produce in the end? Absolutely nothing. And here's what the end looks like. I shared with you guys on Wednesday. I want to share with you once more in Mark chapter 34, verse 37. 
It says, when he called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I want to point something out. While salvation is free, following Jesus never was. Salvation is a free gift. But following Jesus will absolutely cost you something. Jesus says it will cost you your life. And we talked about this on Wednesday. Please don't misunderstand. The cross isn't inconvenience. The cross isn't momentary difficulty. The cross for every person listening to that message at that moment meant one thing and one thing alone, death. It will absolutely cost you something. Following Jesus is different than just walking up front and going, yes, I I want salvation. I want fire insurance. Yes, that sounds good to me. Being a follower of Jesus Christ, there was a reason why there was 12 and then a large multitude and then maybe 120 at the end. Because following Jesus is not what everybody wants to do. Call ourselves disciples and apostles. And guys, i got to be honest with you, I, I even feel sometimes ashamed imagining that I'm going to stand before some of the actual disciples and apostles and go, oh, so what'd you give up? What'd your death look like? What, what, what'd you lose for, for his name's sake? Uh, it's a good question. I, I'm not really sure what I, what, what, I thought, what, what I was willing to die and lay down for the sake of the Lord. I mean, maybe like my Sunday mornings for a couple hours? That's a, that's a pretty serious you know, inconvenience. I mean, I remember one time Pastor Ryan gave this really good message on, on tithing, and I think I put 10 bucks in afterwards, and that was hard. That was hard. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. The compromise you think you're making that, that's going to make a difference, guess what you get in the end? Zilch. Zip. Nada. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For watch this. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Right? We've heard that part before. What will it gain him? Absolutely nothing. But I love the last line. This is the one that got me on Wednesday. I'm going to share it again because I thought it was that good. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You know what that means? It means when you get to the end and you've lived a life of compromise and you haven't been sold out for the Lord and you come to realize that you were never really following Jesus, you were just following your own desires and your own conveniences and your own hearts in the moment, you know what you'll do? You'd give it all up in that moment to simply be counted as one of his kids, one of, a member of his kingdom, to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You'll do anything and everything, and you know what you'll find out then? Too late. It says, what won't they give up in that moment? What won't they give up to get their soul back? To have it not cost them at all? To come to the end and not be disappointed in the end? He says, they'll give it all up. They'll suffer through endless ages of agony and torment, and whatever it is, whatever the temptation is, this is not a message so we understand that, 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 that teaches that we have to earn our salvation. No, no, no. This is a message about being sold out for Jesus Christ. This is a message about considering whether or not you're actually being led by the Lord or whether or not you're just simply saying that you're led by the Lord. Guys, salvation is free. You give your life to Jesus. He'll save it. But you've got to give your life to Jesus. That's the key. Not, yeah, I'll do the prayer. I'll recite. I'll, 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 I'll say the mantra or whatever it is that you guys do. Raise the hand. No, you've got you to lose your life. You've got to follow Jesus to the very end. I said at the beginning that the tactics of the enemy doesn't change. In 1 John chapter 2 verse 16 it lets us know that the three main ways that the Lord or three main ways that the enemy brings temptation into our life is through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And and those tactics aren't going to change. You realize whatever it is, maybe it's not the pinnacle of the temple that he's bringing you up to but it's the pinnacle of your career. 
Uh, maybe it, it, it's not bread that he's offering, but, but that relationship that you so long for or the, the happiness that you so want in your life. May, maybe it, it, it's not overtly worshiping Satan, but maybe it's just choosing to worship something else besides God or in conjunction with God. You see, the tactics of the enemy are the same, but so is the solution. James 4, 7, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You think about that for a moment. Think about the people that cast out and chant out and, 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 and rebuke. And You know how you get rid of the attacks of the enemy? Submit to God. No thank you, devil. And guess what he does? He leaves. You know why? Because he, that's a lost cause. Ain't no point in continuing fighting for that one. They're already given over completely to God. They got nothing to give me. They're sold out for Jesus. They got nothing to offer me. And so it's time for me to take a hike. That's how you're victorious. And that's how, watch this, because we'll cover this next week. That's how the first part, that's the pr first part. God trains us up through temptation that we would then move on to ministry, to service, to healing. And we're going to talk about that all next week. But the training has to come first.